Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Tuesday webinar sponsored by uh, Universal Peace Federation USA and the Washington Times Foundation. This is going to be a very interesting session today. We're going to kind of prognosticate about where China is going, where uh, North Korea is going, and uh, if they're still on the same track. There's a China in some ways has a lot more in common with the South of Korea than it does with the North, and and North Korea is, uh, I think nobody ever foresaw when it, the country was formed that it was going to, to be a dynasty. So there, there's a lot of things to talk about here. It is my great pleasure to introduce to our host and moderator, Dr. Michael Jenkins, who is the president of the Washington Times Foundation, which uh, sponsors the Washington Brief webcast and also these Tuesday seminars. He's the chairman of the Washington Times Holdings, which uh, owns the uh, Times News Organization. He's led a number of very well-received fact-finding trips to Korea and Japan that have met with the legislative, executive, intelligence, and military leadership of those countries, and something we're going to crank up again as soon as uh, we can do it without a two-week uh, two uh, quarantine. As president of the nonprofit uh, NGO, the Universal Peace Federation International, Dr. Jenkins has decades-long experience uh, in starting and conducting peace initiatives all over the world, particularly in the two major flashpoints right now, Northeast Asia and the Middle East. So welcome, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Larry. I'm very honored to be with you and to our listening and viewing audience, both in America and throughout the world. Uh, we're very excited about today's program. We're going to take a look at uh, North Korea, DPRK, and China's relationship, and what some of the issues may be there that may also uh, be uh, very important to understand how much uh, the DPRK does not want to be completely under China's control or influence. We have a very special guest panelist today, Mr. Doug Bondo. Dr. Lyle Jared Goldstein, and also we have Humphrey Hoxley. First, I'd like to introduce Mr. Doug Bondo. Doug is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, specializing in foreign policy and civil liberties. He worked as special assistant to President Ronald Reagan and editor of the political magazine Inquiry. His prolific commentary, commentator in the public square, regularly writing for the Wall Street Journal, National Interest, Fortune Magazine, and the Washington Times, as well as the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's been widely published in periodicals such as Foreign Policy, Harper's National Review, The New Republic, Orbis, The American Spectator, Time, Newsweek, and Fortune. His column, La Prensa, Economic Freedom and the Press, syndicated in 1988 by Copley News Service, won the Mencken Award for Best Editorial Op-Ed column. Uh, Doug speaks frequently at academic conferences and on colleges and is featured on all the major networks. I'd like to welcome at this time a great friend and expert in security and peace, Mr. Doug Bondo. Welcome, Doug. Thank you very much, Michael, and Larry as well. It's a great pleasure to be back uh, working with the Foundation and the Federation on in important issues like this and being on a panel with uh, such distinguished participants. There's an awful lot here. It, uh, Despite the crisis du jour, which we're dealing with today, Afghanistan, which is in fact a very serious issue, over the long term, China continues to loom as probably the greatest geopolitical challenge that the U.S. faces. But in certain ways, North Korea may be the more explosive or unpredictable one. So you put China and North Korea together and you have a very interesting you know, combination and something that you know, poses an extraordinary challenge to the US and America's objectives in Northeast Asia. And the question then is what should we expect in the coming months and years and how should the US and its allies try to respond to that? You know, it's very important to recognize the relationship between North Korea and China is not an easy one. They have traditionally referred to themselves as as close as lips and teeth, presented themselves as being great friends, you know, great allies, but that's really never been the case. You know, China, to a certain degree, China just out of the revolution was dragged into the conflict uh, between the Koreas you know, by St Joseph Stalin. Uh, he wanted Mao and the Chinese to back up North Korea when it invaded South Korea. 
you know, that really created an enduring Cold War between China and the United States. It was a bitter, bloody war. But the North Koreans were never particularly uh, grateful for what happened. And indeed, as Kim Il-sung you know, took control within his system, he took out all of the other factions that included the pro-Beijing, uh, the pro-Chinese faction. China was not happy. He and Mao didn't particularly get along. He didn't like the Cultural Revolution. Mao was offended by the notion of kind of monarchical communism, where you pass on uh, your regime to your kids, you know, where uh, Kim Il-sung was doing that with Kim Jong-il. That, um, you know, so this was a relationship that was never a particularly easy one. And it's very important to recognize that North Korea has always focused on being independent. It's never wanted to be subservient to any country, including its nominal allies, you know, whether that be you know, Russia and China today or, or others. And it's been willing to play them off against one another. Indeed, if you go to North Korea, one of the stunning things that I found was you see very little communist imagery. It's all Kim Il-sung, it's Juche, it's self-reliance. It's a focus on North Korea, not on an alliance or allegiance to communist party leaders. You, know, you don't have statues of Stalin and of Mao and of Marx and of Lenin. You know, what you do is you have statues of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il and pictures of them all over. The focus is very much an independent one. And I think that's very conscious. And you know, we found the Chinese you know, have not been particularly happy with them. Before 2018, Xi Jinping had not met at all with uh, Kim Jong-un. Indeed, the Chinese and the, you know, went along with a number of sanctions proposals of the Obama administration. You know, by uh, you know, 2018, Xi had met six times, I believe it was, with Park Wen-hee of uh, South Korea. In fact, she had a a place of honor at the 2015 parade uh, celebrating the anniversary of the end of the <laughs> Second World War, <laughs> Kim Jong-un had had no contact, no direct contact. But then once the uh, uh, summit was arranged with uh, President Trump, everything changed. And suddenly there were five summits with Xi Jinping. And it appears that what uh, the, the Chinese are very concerned about is they recognize that North Korea might make a deal with America. That in fact, you know, from a, a North Korean standpoint, and to a certain extent, the same way of South Korea is having the distant superpower, your friend, is good, because that distant superpower is less likely to get involved in your affairs than the country just across the river, you know, to your north. And the Chinese were very concerned about that, and they got back involved very, very seriously. And what we see recently has been very interesting. You know, North Korea has closed itself off essentially to the world because of COVID-19, but we've seen uh, them as trying to open up, it would appear economically more to China. Uh, disinfecting station on the border with China that they have been trying to get uh, in operation and apparently was an issue that uh, caused him to demote a couple of his officials who hadn't done what he wanted on it. The new uh, North Korean ambassador to China is one of specialists in trade. And actually Kim himself recently went to the Friendship Tower in Pyongyang to kind of laud the friendship with China. And this has not been uh, you know, what he's typically done in power. So it certainly would look like uh, at a time of great economic need, North Korea is looking to China to help keep it afloat while it's trying to close off its border. It's cut itself off in many ways from uh, countries, including in, over the past year, in many ways, China itself, but that seems to be opening up. So this suggests a closeness in that relationship that we haven't seen a lot. And I think that reflects need, not because they want it, but because they need it. And if you look at the interests of North Korea and China, it's important to recognize that at some points they coincide, but they diverge in some important ways. I think fundamentally, North Korea wants support. You know, it recognizes it has economic problems. It wants to be a nuclear state, but it wants economic development. And it's got, you know, facing sanctions. And at the moment, it's essentially sanctioned itself but it wants its independence. It doesn't want to turn its power over to uh, China. China wants denuclearization. There are some Americans who argue that you know, China is playing all of this and that China doesn't want a nuclear North Korea. It understands a nuclear North Korea is independent and potentially dangerous. You know, they would much prefer to have a docile buffer state, not one that has nuclear <laughs> weapons. But China also doesn't want an implosion. China does not want to have a collapse. China doesn't want millions of refugees flowing across its border. It doesn't want loose nuclear weapons. It doesn't want civil war, factional fighting, any number. Imagine a nuclear Mexico 
falling apart? What would America think of that? Americans wouldn't want that. Texans and Arizonans and New Mexicans certainly wouldn't want that. So the tension I think is very evident here where both sides want certain things, but they're a bit different. And for them to go work together is not so easy. And if you look at policy over time, it's changed. I mean, 2017, the Chinese were willing to go along with sanctions. Now they seem much more protective of North Korea. And I think what you see here is then they're reflecting their own interests, where they stand, as well as some tensions with the United States. That from a Chinese standpoint, you know, its relationship with the US was easier, say, in 2016 than today. You know, so that relationship also plays in there. President Biden, like other American presidents, has said, we'd love to have China help us on this, but China doesn't have much reason to do favors for America, especially given the relationship today. And that's just a reality, that if you have a bad relationship, and this isn't a question of who's to blame, the reality simply is, from Beijing's standpoint, they have very little reason to be helpful to the United States. And I think the basic challenge here is that the US policy is to advocate policies, namely sanctions, which threaten to implode or destroy North Korea. So from a Chinese standpoint, even if you want denuclearization, you don't want to adopt a means to that end, which might destroy North Korea. Again, you don't want an implosion. You don't want it to fall apart. So the US is pushing China to take policies that might achieve one of the ends they don't want, which is why, especially these days, I think China is probably on the other side trying to help keep North Korea afloat as opposed to putting more pressure on which we typically want. So if we want to get China to help the United States, we have to address their concerns. And I think that is something we have to essentially decide how much we're willing to pay to try to get Chinese support. You know, for example, if there's a collapse of North Korea, do we help the Chinese? Do we pay for any of it? What do we do, you know, if millions of refugees suddenly start flowing north of the Yalu? You know, this is something where the Chinese don't want to be left holding the bag. What if China wants to send troops into uh, a, an imploding North Korea? Would we find that acceptable? What if, North, what if China wanted to essentially prop up a puppet state there? What would we think of that? I mean, these are issues I think we would have to come to some conclusion on and have serious discussions with China if we really think they're going to do what we want in terms of putting enormous pressure. And frankly, the question of reunification is very important. From a Chinese standpoint, they don't want a reunified Korea allied with America and American troops on their border. And you know, if we were there, we wouldn't want that either. So are we prepared, for example, to promise to pull US troops out if there's reunification? I mean, you have to consider the Chinese viewpoint. We, we don't do that very well. And again, it's not a question of whether we like the Chinese position. It's if you want China to help us, you have to understand why they take the position they take that we can't assume they will do what we want simply because we want it, especially given the relationship today. And to me, that's the fundamental issue that if you really want Chinese assistance, frankly, we have to look at the overall US-Chinese relationship. And that is extraordinarily complex at the moment. We have such a range of issues, security issues in Asia, territorial questions, Taiwan, human rights issues, economic disputes. There's an awful lot there. So this is going to be one other part of that. Now, to the extent we could start working with China and finding ways to at least reduce tensions, are there ways that we could talk about Taiwan, for example, to kind of you know, drop down the tensions, you know, reduce the confrontation and try to keep you know, a fairly, a system that we have today going where both sides accept something they're not particularly happy with, but it's certainly better than the alternative. Can we do that in some ways on human rights? Are there ways to tamp down potential disputes over territorial claims. These are issues where if we can make some progress on these, then I think we have a chance of doing the same on North Korea. But I think this is going to be an extraordinary challenge. You know, both North Korea and China are challenges separately. You put these issues together, much more complex. So this is an issue I hope the Biden administration is willing to focus on that uh, issues like, unfortunately, uh, Afghanistan will tempt the administration to put North Korea especially on the back burner or the far back burner, I think that's dangerous. We have estimates from the RAND Corporation and the SON Institute that in six years, they could have 200 nuclear weapons. We don't want that. This is something the Biden administration and the rest of us need to work on. It's very complex and I'm very glad to see the Federation and the foundation taking on this issue. We need to be talking about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Excellent commentary, great insights. I look forward to our discussion.
This time I'd like to introduce Dr. Lyle Jared Goldstein. Lyle is the founding director and research professor at the China Maritime Studies Institute, CMSI, at the Naval War College. On the broader subject of U.S.-China relations, Lyle published this very excellent book, Meeting China Halfway, in 2015. Over the last several years, Goldstein has focused on the North Korea crisis. He speaks Russian as well as Chinese and has done research in both countries numerous times. He's also an affiliate of the Naval War College's new Russia Maritime Studies Institute. I would like to welcome at this time, Dr. Lyle Jared Goldstein. Welcome, welcome, Lyle. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's great to be here and uh, very honored to uh, follow Doug Bandow, somebody who I've uh, long admired uh, and, uh, and I agree with uh, just about everything he had to say there. So, but let me see if I can add uh, a little bit. I made some slides for you. So I'm hoping you can see that. Let's see here. Very good. Okay. Very good. Um, so I thought I would, uh, I, I have uh, been doing a lot of travel in the region uh, and I uh, thought I would um, start out maybe just by telling you about a couple of times I've been down to the China North Korea border uh, and I'm so glad that the Federation is doing this uh, wonderful um, discussion because this issue uh, needs to be thought about very, very carefully. Uh, so I made trips down to Dandong and Hunchu, and there you can see them in the red circles. Um, Dandong, uh, the China North Korea border, and Hunchu is actually where three countries meet, including Russia there too. So uh, I'll just speak about that a little bit too. Um, but um, let me say straight off very emphatically that, that uh, I work for the for Uncle Sam, but my, um, you know, these are my own views. I want to be very clear about that and uh, don't represent any kind of official assessment. Uh, you can see here right in the middle, in a way, is a quite an interesting picture I snapped in the uh, uh, just uh, uh, newly uh, refurbished uh, Chinese military museum. And uh, you can see there, uh, it's quite interesting that that plane bears a North Korean Air Force marking. And that uh, seems to show a kind of new approach to uh, understanding the Korean War. It was a long time that China didn't really talk openly much about the Korean War for a long period, but now uh, this is once again in vogue and I'll, uh, I'll explain that change, okay? Uh, but here's a look at the border, how it looks uh, down in Hunchun, uh, where I was at the end of 2017. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. You can ride this high-speed rail as I did, the uh, Gautia, as they say in Chinese, uh, the, this is a, a shot I took from the Gautia, from the high-speed rail line that goes right into Huanchun. Uh, here you see, it's one of actually the most scenic uh, high-speed rail lines in China, which says a lot, by the way. But uh, well, I must have passed through maybe 100, 150 huge tunnels in the process of traveling down to the border. Just imagine what that expense is, uh, billions of dollars, maybe even tens of billions or $100 billion to build such a line. So. I think you might get an idea of what China's strategy is when you just think about that, a high-speed rail line that delivers you right down to the uh, river border with uh, North Korea. And, and right here across the Tumen River, which isn't very deep at all, you can see uh, North Korea right there. So you're able to look in there. And by the way, uh, shockingly little security there, uh, I must say, uh, going off my visit. And that checks out for the other part of the border that I visited recently too, that was in Dandong. And here you see me standing in front of the famous bridge across the Yalu River. Uh, here's uh, General Peng, the, the China's hero from the Korean War, uh, led the Chinese so-called volunteers there. Uh, here are a couple of colleagues of mine walking into Starbucks. And yes, you can, you can buy a Starbucks coffee uh, just about a hundred yards from the Yalu River, which is pretty amazing if you think about it, uh, how things have changed, right? Um, back to the um, uh, Central Military Museum in Beijing, where you see a lot of American trophies. These are American tanks, uh, hardware the Chinese brought back and said, hey, you know, we, we took on the Americans. They're very proud of that. By the way, this, this is a Soviet tank that they, uh, that's a special interest of mine in writing a book now on Russia-China relations. So that, that, that was from the 1969 uh, confrontation, but it's it's quite interesting to see just how high profile those trophies are. And this is something, you know, China's really beating its chest about. I, I want to be very clear about that. Here they, you know, here's a graphic, for example, from one of their aviation magazines showing the shoot down of an American jet. 
Um, now, Xi Jinping, uh, even before he became president, was talking a lot about the Korean War. This is on the 60th anniversary. So this is back in 2010. I happened to be in China at the time, and I was amazed how much they were talking about this. But you can see uh, here's a speech he gave again before he was president, but saying this was a great victory over the Americans. Um, so Xi Jinping, you know, it said he has a deep interest in history. Uh, that's coming out now. And really, I read the Chinese military newspaper and watch the Chinese military news basically every day. And I can tell you, it's it's astounding how much coverage they now give the Korean War. Uh, almost every day, there's an article or an interview with a veteran and so forth. And uh, of course, Xi Jinping gave a major speech back on October 13, a uh, very fiery speech about uh, how uh, China uh, will dare to stand up to America, has done it before, may do it again. Um, but, uh, uh, Doug Bandow, entirely correct that China has been kind of a torn, has been uh, had differing opinions on this issue. And undoubtedly, right when Xi Jinping came into office, the China did adopt a harder line. Now, by the way, um, you know, I'll show you some of this Chinese material that I go through on a daily basis. But this sort of summarizes really what uh, Doug Bandow was just saying. But if we want to um, summarize China's approach in six characters, here they are. OK, Bujan. Okay, no fighting, no chaos, no collapse. That's a pretty good summary of where uh, what, what China's priorities are. But look at also this interesting quote here saying, you know, if nuclear if denuclearization fails, China will be harmed the most. So there was a current of thinking in China that was that really wanted to crack down on North Korea during that period of, say, 2013 to 20, uh, 2017, 2016, 2017. Okay. That group, though, I think has been in retreat most recently, and I'll explain that. Now, if you want to get really, I think, the clearest statement in English of where China is out on these questions, consult this document by uh, Fu Ying. Uh, that makes clear sort of China's uh, position. This, is, this came out with Brookings, but she is a very authoritative for, uh, voice. So I do suggest people uh, look this up and read it. Uh, the English is there. Um, I've written quite a bit about this, tried to map out where Chinese experts are, and they really are quite all over the place. So you have some, uh, Chu Shulong, for example, saying, no, you know, we need to absolutely cut ties completely with North Korea. They're a rogue state. Uh, that's pretty rare, though. Most people cluster in the middle, kind of limited support for North Korea. But then there are those like Yan Shui Tong, who's a very famous strategist in Beijing, who says, no, 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 we have to help. We have to support North Korea much more. Okay, so this has been a debate raging in Beijing for a number of years um, that I've been watching. Well, uh, let's go to what Americans think, though, for a minute. And here I did a, a survey of Naval War College expert faculty, many of them having background in Asia Pacific and Peninsula Affairs. And it was interesting to see when I surveyed them uh, that they thought the most important factor in North Korea's search for nuclear weapons was. Uh, in fact, regime security, a, a large majority holding that, not pointedly not coercing unification, uh, and that they put um, a priority, uh, a majority that does on avoiding a catastrophic war, which th that's important to keep in mind. I, I'll be happy, by the way, to send this study. It's, it's quite an interesting study. In that study, we used some new methodologies. One of them was to use, you know, the, the, the format of debate, which, you know, hey, that's the American way. Let's debate these very complicated questions. One of the debates was, would, would China really get involved? And here we had a, a nice debate between that, those two positions. You know, one scholar saying, no, no, China would stay out if they possibly can. But another saying, no, in fact, China is likely to intervene. Now, I found this a uh, graphic which which looks a little cartoonish, but I uh, suggest we take it seriously. This is probably the, the closest glimpse to what China, how China would see a military scenario going down. And, uh, you know, I could come back to this if people want to talk more about it. But suffice it to say, yes, Chinese forces do enter North Korea in force. There's actually an invasion across the Yellow Sea. Um, I guess there's good news. There are allied tanks here in, uh, in Pyongyang. I guess that means we sort of win. But here's a Chinese plane shooting down an American plane. That's not good. Uh, we can go back to this if you like, but this is uh, not authoritative, but I think, uh, let's say, more than a little interesting. And uh, when we look at what Chinese experts are saying, you know, they are quite convinced that uh, that North Korea will not uh, bargain away uh, the nuclear weapons. You know, that's been pretty consistent among Chinese specialists. Um, and um, partly, as you can see here, these experts... Um, 
I took particular note of since they had graduated from Kim Il Sung University. There's Chinese experts who, who had studied in North Korea, but they said this partly derives from the North's uh, a conventional weakness. So that's something we should keep in mind too. The conven how the conventional balance affects nuclear questions. Now, uh, just a quick mention on the Russian side. Um, you know, this is from uh, Tolaraya, who is a, a great, uh, who was ambassador to Pyongyang for a long time. And I think quite plugged in in Pyongyang. He also skeptical that, that North Korea would give up its weapons, but did suggest there were ways that we could pursue arms control. So that's worth considering. But he, I was interested here, for example, that he's taking Chinese proposals very seriously. And that reflects a new kind of coalescing of Chinese and Russian viewpoints. Uh, I think that's that's quite an important development. And uh, I'll just finish up here by saying, you know, the latest, let, let's remember right before the pandemic, she had visited Pyongyang. That was a huge moment, folks, huge. Uh, you know, I can't, uh, you really can't overstate how big that was for the relationship. Uh, and there are other signs that this relationship is moving in a, uh, a more positive direction. And uh, it, there's my timer saying I should be quiet. So I'll just finish up here by summarizing this, this uh, latest piece that I've been looking at. Now, this is from 2020, so it's quite current. Um, you know, just reviewing some of the points that I took from this analysis that, that again, DPRK would not surrender its nuclear arsenal, uh, that the U.S. is almost certainly not going to resort to force. Uh, Chinese think that we've given that up. Uh, this is very interesting, point number three, where it says that, you know, this, this Chinese author is criticizing Chinese colleagues, saying they've exaggerated the North Korean threat to Chinese interests. So saying, you know, they don't think that North Korea really is a rogue state from China's point of view at all. Uh, they don't think Japan and South Korea will go nuclear. That's very interesting finding. And uh, they, they think China and Russia are more or less uh, assume tacit acceptance of the of the Korean uh, North Korean nuclear arsenal. So uh, and I'll, I'll just foot stomp what uh, Doug said there about uh, this recent visit by uh, Kim Jong Un to the uh, China North Korea Friendship Monument in Pyongyang, you know, that was covered in China, of course, and, and uh, has a positive reverberation there. So, you know, thing, I do think we'll see this relationship gradually uh, improve now uh, as the pandemic eases. Okay, that's, that's what I have been happy to talk more about sort of policy prescriptions and so forth, but thank you very much for uh, inviting me and letting me share some ideas. Thank you, Lyle, excellent presentation. Next, we have Mr. Humphrey Hoxley, Humphrey is a journalist and author whose latest Asian Waters has really been popular and talks about the struggle over the Pacific and the Indo-Pacific and the challenge for American powers. I'm going to bring up the book in a moment. His reporting on the BBC with the BBC has taken him to crises all throughout the world, including postings in Delhi, Colombo, Manila, Hong Kong and Beijing. His journalism has appeared in most mainstream media in the UK and the US and his lecture venues include the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, the Rand Corporation in Los Angeles and Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. Uh, Humphrey is the monthly host of the Democratic Democracy Forum, uh, the debate in the Asian, on the Asian region. Uh, there's a widespread truth in his profession that every journalist has a half-finished novel in his desk drawer. We have two books we'd like you to share with you very quickly. Uh, one is, first of all, I have to share my screen. One is a, a favorite for me. It's called Asian Waters. And Asian Waters is excellent, excellent historic uh, review of the whole Indo-Pacific North, South Korea, China, and the key nations are reviewed chapter by chapter. I just reread the one on Taiwan because of the current tensions that are occurring there. And also he goes into de in depth on the South China Sea. I also read this novel, Man on Fire, and I highly recommend it. It's a riveting experience. It'll be hard to put down once you start because it shows uh, what would happen if a uh, a conflict, a live conflict broke out in the United States uh, in the Bering Strait and the little and big Diomede Islands. So I want to welcome at this time our dear friend, he's no stranger to the Washington Times and the Washington Times Foundation with his fact finders together to Korea. 
And we're honored to present to you, Mr. Humphrey. Thank you. Thank you, Universal Federation, for inviting me onto this panel. And, and thank you, Michael, for that kind introduction. We must stop meeting like this and see each other very soon in person. Yeah. Um, Larry Moffitt, the great arranger of these events, asked if I had any slides for this. And I now know that I couldn't have beaten Lyle's brilliant presentation there. I was fascinated on the the range of debate that you showed that going on in China about that. But I thought I probably wouldn't use any of my slides because we're actually looking ahead. We're doing a bit of crystal ball gazing and anyone who was around in 1989 for the Berlin Wall or indeed 2021, looking at those dreadful scenes in Afghanistan now understands that how many billions you sink into intelligence gathering and forecast much of life, both good and bad, sneaks up on you and takes you by surprise. And that goes for geopolitics as well. I have a few points to make and two scenarios to point out. And, and all of you out there, wherever you are in the world, can decide at the end of it which one is preferable. It'll probably be something in between. Uh, but some of the points, the first I'd like to point out is that it is in the US interest, in the West's interest, that the China and North Korea relationship sustains. I'll go into that in a moment. It's, we've heard it has its ups and downs, and that, but it needs, I think, to sustain. Second, when we talk about the unpredictability of a North Korean flare-up, a lot of that unpredictability lies not in China or with North Korea, but in with the US reaction to anything that might unfold there, whether it's big or whether it's small. Because as we've heard from Doug and from Lyle, uh, Beijing, Washington, to some extent, Moscow, North Korea is a buffer, it's a proxy of which wider issues can be played out. And that can always be dangerous, not necessarily North Korea's nuclear weapons, because if the regime used them in earnest at any time, it knows it could be obliterated in seconds and you don't maintain such an enduring dynastic dictatorship by being that stupid. <clears throat> and to put that in perspective about American reaction, after the Afghan and Iraq wars and the Vietnam War became what they were because of America's reaction to events, the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam and 9-11 for Afghanistan, and then more opaquely for Iraq, which got all muddled up in that as well. And the third, this is my view, not attached to any organization, is that the best way for North Korea to evolve is to is under the Chinese umbrella of authoritarianism blended with economic reform, the very system that we in the West allowed to unfold in China after it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. What it's achieved there in terms of wealth creation, development, and poverty of alleviation has been remarkable. I know that there's the values in Xinjiang and Taiwan and all the rest of it, but that's, a, that's actually a different issue. North Korea has the potential to do the same, and it can begin to mirror the South. As say, the Chinese border city of Shenzhen grew from a fishing village to a glittering mega city that mirrored skyscraper for skyscraper, Hong Kong next door. Now, because of the politics and the national security law and all the rest of it, they're even closer politically aligned. Now, what are the challenges to this happening, even if we wanted it to happen? One, of course, is the American and the UN sanctions, and it would make it impossible for Apple, Microsoft, any multinational to set up factories in, um, in uh, uh, North Korea, as they have in China, and grow the economy. Second, the North Korean regime. Does it have the vision and the confidence to loosen its grip enough to really grow the economy and spread the wealth as China did? And then there's China itself, as we've heard from the two previous panelists. Will it have the patience to mentor its recalcitrant ally? And will it be able to keep its control of what it wants North Korea to actually be? And as we've heard previously, there have been a lot of strains on this relationship, and it's never been a particularly happy one. South Korea, of course, comes into this because China's medium term goal is to pry South Korea away from the US and get American troops off the Korean Peninsula. That's a, that's a very big issue in Beijing. Now, many of you out there will be thinking, you know, some of these are crazy wild ideas. I mean, why lift sanctions or how do you lift sanctions from a rogue nuclear state? 
and even if you did, which right-minded multinational uh, would set up a major operation there. Yeah, I agree with all of that. But the trajectory I'd like you to imagine, because in the Universal Peace Federation, we, we try to look forward with a bit of optimism. The trajectory I'd like you to imagine is one of Vietnam, outcast, sanctioned, impoverished for some 15 years after it defeated the United States, but slowly the world turned and it was allowed to become an Asian economic tiger and is now ironically seen as a like-minded ally in the formation of a front against China in the Indo-Pacific. Vietnam uh, and China were allies during the Vietnam War, but like North Korea, Vietnam always saw itself as fiercely independent and even fought a short border war with China in 1979. <clears throat> now the China-North Korea relationship has its ups and downs, and, but I think they will remain glued to each other. Bilateral trade has increased more than 20 fold in the past two decades. And as Lyle showed with his slides, rail shipping links and all that have been expanded enormously with billions of dollars of investment. Without China, North Korea would be fragile and dangerous. Now, there was an idea, probably going back to the early 2000s, imagined in the corridors of American and European power that a liberated North Korea would usher in the flags of democracy, but that would never have happened. And that vision now lies trampled from the failures of bringing democracy to the Islamic, <coughs> excuse me, to the Islamic world. Now we need to know this in the West. We need to understand it because we're seeing in our television every day now the consequences of not understanding and not knowing it. South Korea and Taiwan took half a century to become democracies. We only gave Afghanistan 20 years working from a much lower base. If we take ownership of North Korea in some way, how long would our staying power be there? Now, I'd just like to give you a couple of scenarios of, of say, China abandoning North Korea, the sudden collapse of the regime. And we heard from Doug, the massive humanitarian crisis with refugees flowing north into China, south into South Korea. To stop that, aid would have to be delivered through the country. But if the regime has collapsed into some form of anarchy, as we've seen in Iraq, as we've seen with ISIS and that, breaking down into different regions, it would require military intervention. And to do that, you would have to neutralize air defenses. And there would have to be those agreements that we heard earlier between the US, South Korea, China, and other states. Beijing would naturally insist on a buffer zone send its troops in 30 miles, 40 miles deep, South Korea would have to agree on that. And finally, of course, North Korea's weapons of mass destruction would have to be neutralized in some way. One war game a few years back, it might have been at the Naval War College, I think, uh, found that it would take 90,000 troops, 56 days to secure North Korea's nuclear materials. And in that time, the fracturing regime would distribute weapons grade material to terrorist groups, states all around the world. And then there was a prevailing view in Washington at the time that China should be allowed to take control of those materials because the Yongbyon base is only 80 miles from the border. Um, that's a pretty grim scenario to happen. Uh, the fractious US political establishment we would be divided as it is now, say, over Afghanistan. Japan would be tense. South Korea would feel vulnerable. And in North Korea itself, the party elite, people that you need to keep the society together, would be aware of the punitive measures that the US took against the Iraqi army. By summarily dissolving it, it wouldn't trust whatever promises were laid in their side. You have a complete dangerous collapse of that. You have the humanitarian crisis of the concentration camps, the brutality that's taken odd. You've got Pakistan giving nuclear, um, uh, nuclear materials and designs and that. You've got a lot of stuff that will come out and a lot of countries, including China, including our own, would be seen in a bad light. So in a nutshell, there are two scenarios. We can give 
North Korea channel to grow its economy under Chinese mentorship, that for some decades from now it will resemble the South, and the rhetoric for wealth creation will become more powerful than the rhetoric for war. Or we could muddle along as we are now with North Korea creating a bigger risk for those bad surprises that we've come across, scenarios for collapse that none of us would like to imagine. For scenario one, allow half a century. For scenario two, I'd say keep your seatbelts on because it could happen at any time. Thank you very much for giving me the time to speak. Humphrey, always it's uh, really refreshing and, and profound to hear you, you know, clarify all these areas of, of interest. And we wanted to have a nice discussion now with you and with the panelists. Uh, Bill Gertz uh, wrote uh, last week and it, uh, it went viral. Uh, headline was China emerging as a strategic winner in the US in the US route in Afghanistan. Bill Gertz is an international security reporter for the Washington Times. And he was on a lot of uh, major networks after that. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, Lyle, what do you think about the situation of Afghanistan and what does it encourage China uh, to, to believe it can do now with that kind of Yeah, it's a really interesting situation. I mean, uh, of course, China and Afghanistan are neighbors, so uh, it does beg the question of, you know, is, uh, is China going to uh, step in and uh, step into the vacuum? Um, you know, I, I personally think this probably says a lot about China's intentions. You know, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, people in D.C. and elsewhere who um, I think exaggerate uh, China's aggressive intentions. I mean, China has many, many neighbors. Afghanistan is one of them. Um, and if, if they wanted to, if China, you know, China is far and away the most powerful, um, has the most powerful military forces in Central Asia. I don't doubt that for a minute. And I watched them exercising hard uh, their forces in, the, in uh, China's Western provinces, but uh, I, they don't seem to have any interest or inclination of, of uh, deploying forces into Afghanistan really at all. I mean, there have been some rumors of sort of private security forces, um, you know, who might protect certain areas. Uh, the other paradox here is that this is, you know, if you think about China's Belt and Road Initiative, and that really is the kind of foundation really for Chinese strategy these days, if you can, if you want a shorthand for it, uh, Afghanistan lies in the very middle of this. So uh, it is a very interesting, it'll be interesting to see where China goes, but they seem inclined to uh, support. Uh, they're willing to work with the Taliban. I think they want to stabilize the situation and hope that it doesn't hurt their bottom line, because that's what China cares about most, is that their Belt and Road investments will come to fruition. That's where I stand. Thanks. Mr. Bondo, or... Mr. Hoxley, go ahead and write on that same topic. I think to some degree um, that uh, you know, Afghanistan is the prize you don't want to win. I mean, from China's standpoint, it creates problems. I mean, the United States effectively spent 20 years trying to stabilize a country that was in the neighborhood of China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, India, and the stands. Uh, I mean, what, what, what a difficult situation for the United States. And now that America is out, China worries about terrorism. China worries about Xinjiang. China worries about instability on its border. You know, Russia has the same kind of concerns. India has very real issues here in terms of the relationship with Pakistan, et cetera. So I think that what China really wants is stability. You know, the Taliban went to visit had a conversation with the Chinese foreign minister. I think that was positive. You know, my, I would like to see stability in you know, Afghanistan. It's a tragic situation. We'd love to see war stop, to see some kind of peace for people there. I think China wants that. And I, I just cannot imagine an occupation. They don't want to be deeply involved. Uh, and I'm happy to have them taking over some of these responsibilities, Frank. And, and, I mean, <laughs> I think this talk of the new Cold War has suddenly subsided because you, the war on terror seems to sort of come back and hit us all in the face. So Russia, China and the US have got a huge common goal, 
now in stopping in in stopping this you know you've got chechnya you've got xinjiang you've got you've got us so we the three those three forces are now bound together against one enemy and then the idea of you know the rising china and all this sort of thing that's going to that's going to subside a bit because there's nothing everybody's much more sensible than the isis terrorist but one other qu quick point michael is that Pakistan, which was a sponsor of the Taliban, particularly of the Haqqani network, the most violent and brutal of them, uh, Pakistan is almost as beholden to China as North Korea is. So China can rein in Pakistan and Pakistan can rein in the Taliban. So in that I, I, I agree with Doug completely there. You know, you have got a very powerful force for good in Beijing which might not share our values in when you have the luxury of thinking of values, but when you're stopping the suicide bomber and the car bomber, China is our ally. Very good. Uh, we're all on the panel together, so feel free to comment on other panelists' um, remarks. We can have a free-flowing dialogue here. I'd like to turn towards Taiwan and China's uh, uh, desire to have China, Taiwan even uh, become more uh, affiliated and one with the one China perspective. Um, tell us about that. Humphrey, why don't you lead off? I read it in your book. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a great optimist on Taiwan. I mean, uh, it's a, it sort of flares up with very useful Cold War talk from time to time. But um, China can't take militarily anything except maybe an offshore island Dongsha or Taiping Island, it could take uh, if it wanted to. But I would suspect it's playing the long game um, and it'll take, I mean, I don't know what what, what my fellow panelists have heard of this, but they want to take it like, like Mao took Beijing. They want the people just to sort of come around, a bit like I guess the Taliban took Afghanistan. You know, people realize that it's not worth the fight, so, so let them in and life can continue as normal, but that's not gonna happen anytime soon. And you'll need a KMT government back in there and then, and, and, and then that, that, will, that will evolve. But at the moment, I don't think, Ch China cannot afford to have a military campaign in Taiwan and lose it. Whereas America can afford to lose Vietnam and Afghanistan and all the rest of it and still remain the world's superpower. Doug, any comment on the Taiwan situation? Do you think it, there's a great threat there. Some say the Taiwan Strait is the most dangerous waters in the world now. I do think it has uh, significant dangers. I mean, the problem is there seems to be at least some impatience in Beijing to resolve this. Part of that I think reflects America's involvement, what they perceive as the US pushing the issue as well, a discussion in the United States about whether we should get rid of strategic ambiguity, make a firm commitment <clears throat> to defend Taiwan, et cetera. And the reality is that Taiwan, the Taiwanese people at least have moved away from China. If you look at young Taiwanese, you know, they basically share nothing with, with China. They certainly don't want to be part, you know, take a, take a nation of 23, 24 million people and suddenly become part of a country of 1.4 billion. Even if it was not, you know, the human rights situation that it is today, why would anyone want to do that? I think the challenge here is to convince everyone to kind of take the policy that we have had in the past, which is it doesn't have to be resolved now, and to try to ensure that no one makes an action that pushes somebody else to act. I mean, a declaration of independence in Taiwan would force China to make certain decisions. And I worry that you know, certain military actions, you know, in terms of the US or others might create greater pressure where China feels a need to demonstrate, you know, that it is capable of or, or taking action. You know, no one wants this to go to war. It wouldn't be in anyone's interest. I do think it's dangerous. So it requires all of us to look at ways of how do we tamp this down? Bio? Right, I would just say, uh... Important to note at the outset that, of course, the Korean situation and the Taiwan situation are, are intimately linked from if you read uh, Chinese histories of the Korean War, as I have, uh, not only do they call it the war to resist America, but they believe the day the war started for China was when the uh, Seventh Fleet entered the Taiwan Strait uh, in, in, uh, 
in June 1950. So, I mean, in effect, the, the Taiwan Strait was the Cassius Belli for the Chinese. Um, I, I guess I hear, I, I would say this, um, I think The Economist is entirely correct. I think Taiwan is far and away the most dangerous uh, flashpoint in the world. I think it's exceedingly dangerous. I'll uh, respectfully disagree with Mr. Hawksley. I, I look forward to reading his book, but my view on it is that China can invade, successfully invade. I don't have much doubt on that issue. Uh, please have me back again and I'll, I'll show you some more slides and explain why that's the case. I've done uh, a huge amount of research on that, but it really just comes down to geography. I mean, this is 90 miles off of China's shore. You know, think of the United States, another superpower, and yes, I call China a superpower. Um, if, China, if the United States wanted to invade Cuba, Cuba could never stand a chance, and the same is true with Taiwan. Uh, nor could China or Russia, anybody help Cuba because it's just too far away. Uh, so the, those are the military facts. And again, I, my background is in military strategy, so that's I'm quite confident of that conclusion. And here I would just say the best approach for the United States is to uh, try to, um, as uh, Doug said, to, to tamp down the situation, to calm people down. How do we do that? One is by reassuring China that, that we don't, we're not departing from the one China principle. In other words, use diplomacy to say, we do agree Taiwan is part of China. We, we've said that back in, uh, you know, that's what uh, President Nixon said, we should just follow that approach. And the last thing I'll say here is, you know, there are some insights to be taken from the Afghanistan situation. You know, unfortunately for Taiwan, Afghanistan was a civil war that we got involved in. Well, civil wars have a way of uh, being messy and being very violent. And, uh, you know, how to put it, I, you know, sometimes you can't just count up the number of weapons and so forth. It, it comes down to morale and things like that and political will. Well, guess what? The issue between Taiwan and, and the mainland is, is also a civil war. So is the Korean Peninsula. So these are very tricky <laughs> situations and the U.S. should be uh, extremely cautious in my view. Thank you. I'll run, uh, I, 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 okay. And I'd just like to, to, to with the scenario, I, I agree with you, Lyle, of course, they could, they could do it and they could take it. But if you're sitting in Beijing and you're trying to do the 17 plus one in Europe and you're trying to do Australia and you've got, all, and, and you've got Afghanistan and all that sort of stuff, why would you do this? Because this is going to take your all, isn't it? So the belt and road and everything else is going to is going to go by the wayside, or, or do you not agree with that? Well, you know, China. I mean, look again. I'm reading the Chinese press. I'm watching every night. It's practically every night that you see a kind of blood curling uh, warning issued by uh, either the Chinese Defense Ministry or the kind of uh, sort of side mouthpiece, the Global Times. If if you read that stuff the way I do, I, I think. You'd be very worried. Uh, th this this will be a surprise. This will be a total uh, bolt from the blue. They are they know that their best way to succeed, kind of bloodlessly, if you will, almost bloodlessly, is to go by surprise. So this will look a lot more like uh, Crimea. Um, now they're hoping that it will. You know, and by the way, they've studied that endlessly. What did Russia do in Crimea? How did they pull that off? That is exactly the kind of annexation that they want. Uh, and and partly they like the Russian approach. Sure, they'll pay some economic cost. But for Xi, why would he do this? Uh, you're right, it's risky. But for him, the benefits are uh, huge for in terms of the staying power and legitimacy of the party, right? I mean, this would be huge uh, for Chinese nationalism. To, now, some good news here, and this is paradoxical, but because of the pandemic and you might say China's success against the pandemic, the party is feeling pretty confident right now. Maybe they don't have to do this. Maybe they don't need this. You know, maybe they're feeling quite good about it and quite secure. Let's hope so. But I do think there are many hawks in Beijing. Uh, unfortunately, I think our policy often has been helping those hawks. But um, those hawks are arguing louder and louder that now is the time to go on Taiwan. And we will, I assure you, we will not have any warning at all. Uh, two quick points. I think the first is not to underestimate the nationalistic feelings over this. And I've taught uh, you know, economics to a number of Chinese students. I've gone there a number of years with a group that's taught in the summer. These students don't like government controls over their lives and their access to the internet. But my goodness, they all believe that Taiwan is Chinese. And they're very strong on that. The second is there are a lot of American policymakers who appear to believe that all the US has to do is declare that we will defend Taiwan 
and Xi Jinping will re re retreat to Zhang Nanhai and hide his face and not to ever show it again. That is simply not going to happen. This is very, very powerful. And it goes well beyond the idea that you can, the US can kind of raise its pinky finger and the Chinese will go away. So I think this, that we need to take this very seriously. How do you all think that the, the situation in Afghanistan um, influences China's thinking on America? Because the Afghanistan situation makes this administration look weak. And if they really believe we're that weak, uh, Taiwan is very tempting. Any thoughts on that? Um, I guess I'm a skeptic in the sense that we spent 20 years in a region that if I was sitting in Beijing, I would say, where does the US not have vital interests? It's Afghanistan. That from a Chinese standpoint, I would want the US to stay in Afghanistan forever, just like I would want the US to go to war with Iran. I would say, please, please do. I wouldn't look at that as being a, a sign of strength. I would look at that as being dissipation of American strength. That instead of concentrating on vital interests, you know, where Taiwan is far more important, you know, Korea is far more important in my view than say Afghanistan. So I, I don't think the Chinese will say after 20 years, the fact you left, you know, means that you're too weak to deal with other crises. Lyle, thank you, Doug. Well, unfortunately, I mean, this, you know, there, there is, I think, a, a lesson for China here that they, um, you know, they, they've long said that we're overstretched. And, um, you know, so for them, this is a clear example of that kind of overstretch. Uh, and, and as it were, you know, um, the adversary um, called our bluff, you know, uh, and, and military power, you know, as it were, might makes right. Um, so, so all of these lessons are, I think, reverberating strongly in Beijing. I, I mean, I have long held that the United States needs to take a more cautious approach in the world, needs to kind of uh, pull in the wagons, if you will, and have a, a, you know, make sure that our commitments are consistent with our interests. And they've long, in my view, been been well out of whack. Uh, Afghanistan, as, as Doug pointed out in his talk, I mean, the idea that we're fighting a war way off in Central Asia is, um, you know, in some ways, it's just mind boggling how we uh, fell into this. And maybe it fulfilled, you know, Al Qaeda's dream to suck the US into a quagmire uh, that was uh, cost us trillions of dollars. That's very unfortunate. But I hate to say it, but from a military point of view, um, Taiwan is also very unfavorable ground uh, to fight on, uh, because it is so proximate to China. So uh, they're, you know, China is well aware of that. They know they hold the military cards. So we had better act cautiously and uh, make sure that our alliances are very defensively oriented and cautious. You know, uh, we don't want to fire first and we should allow for, you know, we, we shouldn't be on hair trigger alert. We should have defensive alliances that allow us to mobilize over time and position forces, you know, after we're mobilized. Um, we shouldn't be have uh, forces spread over the whole world as kind of um, uh, what do you call it? Um, trigger. Uh, you know, that, that could trigger a, uh, a war at any moment. That, that's not a cautious policy. Thank you. Humphrey, uh, about North Korea, do the Chinese really want <laughs> yes. to denuclearize? Is there a scenario where the Chinese should denuclearize? So, sorry, Michael? China, does China really want North Korea denuclearize? No, um, but it is. Um, so I think that I don't, I mean, you know, what, what, what we're talking about here is sort of particularly in the post-Afghanistan thing is that it doesn't want it now to be denuclearized, it wants it to be under control. So if, 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 uh, if, North Korea was to give up its nuclear weapons, it would be a weaker ally than an ally with nuclear weapons. And I think that the scenario that you're getting around the Indo-Pacific now, which like, let's think a month ago, everybody was talking about the Indo-Pacific. Now we're back talking about Afghanistan again. But as the Chinese diplomats are going around the Indo-Pacific, India, 
Philippines, Thailand, or whatever, you can imagine the officials say, well, you know, don't, don't, don't bank on the Americans. You know, they proved you can't bank on them anymore. Uh, you know, we're solid. We've been with the North Korea for 70 years. You know, what I think this is the key thing, and it was beginning to come out now, but Afghanistan has sort of underlined it. So if you're Duterte, or if you're your security against your alliances and that, you are now going to be thinking very differently than you were, um, than you were a couple of weeks ago. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Doug, everybody could unmute again. Doug, uh, what do you think about uh, North Korea and Kim Jong-un wanting to meet uh, President Trump and meeting him on the two occasions? What do you think about uh, his motivation? Why did he want to meet President Trump? Just to uh, be able to keep his nuclear weapons or was he hoping for an economic development of North Korea? It strikes me that Kim Jong-un is notably different from his father and grandfather in the sense that he does want economic development. And he also proved to be somebody fairly skilled on the international scene. That doesn't mean he's a liberal. This is, this is no Mikhail Gorbachev. This is somebody who offed his uncle and has executed plenty of people to stay in power. But I think he has a broader sense of national power for North Korea. It's not out of humanity that he wants North Korea to develop, but he recognizes it'd be stronger. So his hope, I think, was to find a make a deal, which would have required some sacrifice of some nuclear weapons, but getting significant uh, sanctions relief. And my guess is that that was his objective. He really wanted that. And he was prepared to make some kind of a deal, whether it was enough, perhaps not. But I do think it was a positive, which we can build on. I'm not sure where he's at now. He's been moving backwards on economic reform and really gone after South Korean cultural influences, you know, teenagers who listen to K-pop, et cetera. So it looks like he's kind of circling the wagons and it may be out of fear you know, for his regime and what that means. Nevertheless, I do think he's offered us opportunities that his father and grandfather did not. Uh, just last couple of days, the DPRK, Kim Jong-un issued a very strong directive that everyone must put socialism and ideology of socialism first. Uh, why was that? In the time of starvation and suffering, and they're being told we're going to go through another arduous march. Lyle and, and Humphrey, Whitey, and Doug, go ahead and why are they emphasizing the ideology? Lyle? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, they're in a tough spot, uh, but they've been here before and they've been here you know, for arguably for a long time. And, uh, you know, the assessments that I'm reading suggest that uh, this is nowhere near uh, the 90s. Um, you know, probably a lot of this is related to the pandemic. Uh, and China, you know, is standing by North Korea. It looks like Russia will do so as well. So, I mean, um, you know, to me, um, I think, you know, Kim Jong-un can look here and say, you know, be pretty satisfied with uh, where things are going in terms of diplomacy uh, and uh, hoping that sanctions will generally be relieved. But I did, you know, I, I guess I want to emphasize that although, um, you know, occasionally there are some dark signs, but I, you know, I'm probably the scenario that most concerns me is if you have a kind of revolution in Pyongyang, which I agree is not outlandish, it could happen. I mean, these, you know, they may tire of this regime. Uh, if that happens, though, could that trigger a war? Uh, it could, because, um, you know, if Kim Jong-un is in his palace looking out at the square and, uh, you know, he sees a lot of angry North Koreans uh, and he's imagining his head on a pike, you know, what's to stop him from saying, well, I'm going to go out with a bang. You know, and that that to me is a very troubling scenario. And, um, you know, we've never had a nuclear state implode. Um, so. To me, uh, again, we have to handle this with utmost caution. More or less, um, you know, the, unfortunately, maybe the North Korean regime uh, has secured its lease on life with nuclear weapons. We're just going to have to learn to live with them. And I think probably uh, 
you know, gradually tamping down tensions and even reducing sanctions probably is is in the cards. I one more thing I'll say. I think I, I agreed very emphatically with uh, uh, Mr. Hawksley's point about the umbrella Chinese umbrella. I I don't think that's such a bad thing. After all, China has something that South Korea does not. What is that? It doesn't. South Korea is inherently threatening because South Korea could easily absorb uh, North Korea, right? I mean, they're they're literally their countrymen. If South Korea is so glorious, it undermines the rationale for North Korea to exist. China doesn't do that. So China is inherently less threatening. And therefore, it is, you know, China should be the one, the mentor that brings North Korea into the modern world and uh, helps it to be, uh, as uh, Mr. Hawksley said, uh, more, more stable and more palatable, you know, if you will. Thank you. Let's say the North Korean regime collapses. Uh, I know many studies and, and all kinds of uh, perspectives have been developed on this. What, are we ready for that, if that was to occur? Are we ready for a North Korean collapse? I doubt anyone is. Uh, this is something where it would make a lot of sense. Michael, we're not, we're not ready for anything. <laughs> with the Chinese ahead of time. Uh, it's hard because nobody wants to communicate to North Korea. We're thinking of them disappearing and the Chinese don't want to do that to what is a friendly state that they're hoping to keep as a buffer state. But this is something we should all talk about ahead of time because as I'll indicate, I mean, you could have factional fighting, you could have different factions in, in the military, you could have people seize nuclear weapons. I mean, this could go extraordinarily ugly. Uh, you know, it could you know, spill over the borders of Russia, China. It could have, you know, spill over the border with South Korea, it could have impact on Japan. You know, we need to talk about this because I don't think it's imminent, but uh, you know, I think as Lyle indicated, some of these things happen you know, without expectation. And uh, it would be far better if we have lines of communication open and we've talked about how would we cooperate all together to make this work. Humphrey? Humphrey, you have a comment on that? The collapse of North Korea? I, I mean, I, I was just saying this. Yes, I, I've got a weak internet connection or something coming through, but I just, I just want to say, it, you know, there's a whole raft of topics that need to be discussed. There needs to be a sort of pre-conflict global conference in a way, because, you know, how are we going to, how is Russia, America and China going to deal with Afghanistan? How are we going to deal with the imminent collapse or, or a possible collapse of North Korea? How are we going to reduce tension in the Taiwan Straits? And then above all that, you've got this sort of Manhattan Project race going on in the cyber world or the sort of, you know, of, of hitting the electrical grids and, and the infrastructure of things, which is way outside aircraft carriers and guns, but it's not being discussed and it's hugely destructive. So I think that, you know, you've got enough triggers going on at the moment for these the big powers to get together and discuss them all at once. I mean, I remember, at the, or I don't remember, but at, at the end of the Korean War, Vietnam had collapsed, you know, the, 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 Viet, the French had been thrown out of Vietnam. So they sort of put Vietnam into the same conference that was dealing with the, the, the end of the Korean War, you know, just to sort all that out. We need a basket of trigger points to be dealt with now by the big powers as a matter of urgency. You can't cherry pick Taiwan, North Korea, Afghanistan off, because otherwise it's just going to roll up into bigger and bigger disasters. Thank you. Our time has run out. Uh, we'd like everybody to give one final comment, but what I'd like to ask you to comment on is what's your advice for the Biden administration, giving all these sensitivities, uh, starvation in North Korea? Should America do humanitarian aid? Uh, why doesn't China feed uh, North Korea? They could solve the humanitarian uh, starvation problem uh, very rapidly. Why don't they? Uh, what should America do? Lyle? Well, you know, yes, I think I think we should offer humanitarian aid. Um, you know, to my estimate, uh, China is um, providing quite a bit to the regime, uh, especially in terms of energy. I mean, I hasten to say, uh, if, if China wants to turn the lights out in Pyongyang and all over 
North Korea that can it can do that. Uh, it won't though. It's it's made a strategic decision that it will not do that, um, and and that's probably wise because they know an implosion is not in their interest. Um, so uh, you know, to my estimate, um, you know, we we can do a number of things, including just sort of accepting that China will have a role here, a, an important role, maybe more important than South Korea. I think that's very hard for us to accept, but I, I to me that's more realistic. By the way, I think Russia also has quite a significant role. And why is Russia important in this? Well, Russia and North Korea, turns out they have a lot of history. By the way, that reactor, that nuclear program goes back to Russian assistance. So blame the Russians for that. But um, Russia has the has some big advantages, not South Korea and it's not China. And yet it is there and it does care about stability and so forth. So I think there's something there also. But in general, the US should, I think, um, uh, gradually uh, should make more outreach, should de develop more engagement, uh, should should probably begin to consider uh, real diplomatic relations, a softening of sanctions. And, and then I think we can seriously talk about not full denuclearization, that's just not going to happen, but we can talk about limited disarm disarmament. As Doug said, you know, we, you know, it makes a difference if, if North Korea has a couple dozen nuclear weapons versus a couple of hundred, and, and that may be the choice we're looking at. Thank you. Right. Humphrey, and then Doug. Doug, you'll have the last word. Go ahead, Humphrey. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I completely agree. I think that, that, that the US and China now have to start acting almost, you know, together on, on, a, on this crisis um, and work things out between them. And, and I know it's a hard thing to do, and it's a bit of pill to swallow in a way, but it's the only way, it's, it's a workmanlike way to make the world a safer place. Thank you, and Doug? I would urge the Biden administration, this issue has to be attended to. They can't put this on the back burner. We need to find a way to talk with China to say, despite all of our disagreements, this is one, we should look for ways to work together. We have a shared interest here. I'd like to see the US take some unilateral steps to demonstrate we don't have a hostile policy. I mean, everything North Korea says should be taken with a couple of grains of salt. Nevertheless, we could eliminate the travel ban. As Lyle indicated, I think we should offer diplomatic relations. It's stupid not to talk to other countries, especially a potentially unstable nuclear power. We really want to have communication there. We should be uh, easing ways for South Korea to, to work with the North in terms of some sanctions relief that allows something. You know, let's find positive incentives here and keep after the North Koreans to talk. I'd like to see Biden write, let him write a couple love letters. You know, that uh, there was a fairly substantive uh, discussion between President Trump and especially Chairman Kim. Kim actually had some significant comments about his objectives and his problems. Let's have a dialogue, even if it's slow, we need to get that. And that would probably help us find a way, what can we use and offer them to get you know, movement on at least capping their nuclear program, you know, limiting their ambition, these sorts of things. This needs to be a full score across the board approach, the US, South Korea, China, and find a way to bring Japan into this as well, <laughs> and Russia. We all have an incentive here to work this out. I'm free. Everybody froze everybody thank you very much uh we've had a wonderful panel i want to ask uh that you do read asian waters i highly recommend it and man on fire the novel's riveting and also meeting china halfway dr goldstein's book i want to thank dr goldstein mr humphrey hoxley and also mr bon doug bondo uh, experts certainly on this northeast asia area and many other areas of security in the world uh larry moffett is one of the finest uh, moderators and leaders of this uh, effort to have a weekly program. And I want to thank our executive vice president of the Washington Times Foundation, Larry Moffitt. Larry, come back and uh, give us our, our update for the next week. So, Thank you, Michael. And thank you, gentlemen. This was a, this was a terrific discussion. As I said to Lyle in an email, these Tuesday webinars are like a box of chocolates. And you really get some amazing surprises and some great discussion. And we certainly had that today. Next week, we're going to be back into the uh, practical and business uh, environment with the International Association for Peace and Economic De uh, Development is going to be sponsoring 
a webinar on opportunities for trade between North and South Korea. They had a flourishing little project going until a, a couple of years ago there at Kaesong with a factory that was creating revenue for North Korea and opportunities for cross-pollination for both countries. And that got shut down in a crisis and there might be something else coming up. There's talks of an international road. I was happy to see about this uh, high speed train they've got in China, just ready for a, a railroad connection from north to south and a tunnel across the water to Japan. And why not? We've got the technology and we've got nothing else to do. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. See you next Tuesday at uh, 2 p.m. Take care. Drive safe.